Welcome to Radical Anthropology, everybody. Uh, this evening is a very special occasion because it's quite a while um, since we heard uh, Lionel Sims. Uh, Lionel, if you, if you like radical anthropology, Lionel was one of the, one of the major shapers of, of who, we, who we are. Um, and um, uh, if you ask him how he is, he will say he's feeling great. Um, actually, things are slightly more complex, um, and he's not been so well. Um, and what we're going to have to do is slightly risky from my point of view, because it needs a bit of technology. We've recorded um, Lionel's talk um, in two sections, and I'm going to see if I can um, sort of manage that. So please be patient, everybody. I'll just say... Um, Lionel um, is one of the founders, really, of a new discipline, skyscape archaeology. And sometimes it takes somebody from a different discipline to see uh, another discipline in a completely new light and, and, and not, not be so constrained by the traditions and the habits and the assumptions of the previous discipline that they really make uh, a difference. So Lionel was not trained in archaeology. Uh, his his background, of course, is, um, is, is sociology and then subsequently anthropology. Um, but what we're going to hear, hear from Lionel is a really very new and profoundly significant, in my view, and really very, very persuasive interpretation of one of the great monuments. In a way, the only sort of pyramid, it's not exactly a pyramid, but it's on the scale of the pyramids and it's the only one in these islands and it's closely connected of course to Avery Stone Circle and Stonehenge and I'm not going to say very much at all but possibly just to introduce it to everybody, um, whereas RAG has been mainly focused on the human revolution, the establishment of language, culture, kinship, morality, that massive process which took place in Africa about two 200,000 years ago, Lionel has been focusing on where it all went wrong, where, when, why did it all go wrong? And one of the factors in that is, 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 the, is the factor of time. So according to the basic RAG model, we believe that the moon, as well as the sun, but the moon was very, very important as a, as a, as a, as a clock setting the rhythms of early human hunter-gatherer society. And we've got plenty of evidence for that. And what Lionel's managed to do is, is show that in fact uh, these megalithic monuments such as Stonehenge but also Avery with, it, with, its, uh, with, its, with Silbury Hill, uh, you, I, I'm going to say something grotesquely simplified but I think of Stonehenge and, and Avery Stone Circle as kind of massive steering wheels and you turn that steering wheel one way and you're back to the moon and you steer it this way and you're on from the moon to the sun so it's, it's about how the basic temporal structure of society was shifted along of course with many other things and what what most convinced me with Lionel's in, initial um, publication in the journal of the Royal Anthropological Institute which is to, to described Stonehenge as built by people who needed to solarize the moon in other words they were, they were intent on moving away from a fundamentally lunar um, calendar to a solar one and to make that that counter-revolution easier in, in political terms to manage, managed to create a monument which depicted um, the sun towards which they were moving as just a kind of version of the moon, a particular new version of the moon. And now in this lecture this evening, Lionel's going to be making a very similar case for Avery Stone Circle, but in particular for uh, Silbury Hill. Now what I'm going to do now is see whether this is going to work. I hope it's going to work. Hello everyone, and thank you for coming to this talk. My name's Lionel Sims, um, and Chris has kindly asked and invited me to give a talk because I happened to open my big mouth and make a rather large claim about uh, what I feel is a discovery about Avebury, which is the culmination of, I don't know, it must be 30 years of work I've been doing, but especially concentrating on Stonehenge and Avebury. Um, uh, interestingly for me, the clue to how to start trying to understand Avebury came to me through trying to understand Stonehenge. And it became very clear, very early and very obviously 
that without archaeoastronomy, nothing could be done. And archaeoastronomy is the keystone discipline that integrates archaeology, history, anthropology, uh, mythology and folklore. Without archaeoastronomy, nothing will move forward at all in the Neolithic. Um, and the archaeologists are finding this such a bitter uh, pill to swallow that in my view, we've now got evidence that they're choking on the pill that they must swallow. Because the mess that they've got them in, Tilbury Hill itself, the mess is colossal. Because I've, I've, been, read, I've been putting off for years reading this book because I thought it was so boring. Uh, and I said to myself, Lionel, don't read this book. It's just boring. Uh, but I was, of course, wrong. Because in lots of boring detail, there are secrets and you find secrets under the carpet, under the bed. <laughs> um, so I'm now going to, since Chris thinks that anything I might say might be interesting, uh, I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint and I've got to, and I've got to start that and share screen, haven't I? So I'll do that first. Um, yeah, I'm very proud of this opening screen because it's got a moving moon. I don't know how I managed to do that, but there you go. Uh, I'm going to minimise all the pictures, I think. Yeah, there we go. OK. So, yeah, this is the title. Reified Blood Rituals Under a Chiral Moon at Silbury Hill. I hope these words, if they're unfamiliar to you, uh, become understandable soon because although they sound a bit technical, they're exactly the right words to understand Silbury Hill. And by the way, the entire Neolithic cosmology, um, which is of course an enormous claim to make, but here we go. There's a black dot in the middle of Southern England there. For those people who may be watching this when uh, they're, not, they're not familiar with the layout and where Silbury Hill is, but it's in the middle of Southern England. Now, this is the book that I put off reading, perhaps I shouldn't have read that, if archeologists are gonna be present. But um, the Silbury Hill, the largest prehistoric mound in Europe, edited by Jim Leary, David Field, and Gil Campbell. Um, okay, and uh, I've been reading this book now for some months, round and round and round, but there's a detail you must not forget as I'm giving the talk, because that's the list of authors. When they say they're the editors, it's true, they've written two or three chapters or, or sections in the book, but there's another 25 people who have also contributed to the book. And then there's this strange statement in the preface. Contradictions may exist, particularly where strongly held views conflict. Now, to my memory, which is not good, <clears throat> I've never read in the preface that all the authors that share a book don't agree with each other and they might seriously disagree with one another. But keep this in mind as we're going through the stuff, because this is a very strange book where the editors have taken over the main role of interpreting the archeology, span which has been delivered by all of these other specialists who are specialists in soil types, beetles, uh, types of grass, all the other details that the archaeologists can muster as a combined force, they're all that bunch. But the, but the interpretation are quite different types of chapters. And my argument is the interpretation does not fit well with what the experts have said for each of their area of specialism. Um, so th this is a strange book to read. And it gets more interesting as the contradictions build up and build up as you're reading the book. And in my view, by the time you get to the end of the book, the main interpretation that's given is nullified by the main detailed expert witnesses that are studying their particular small niche in the archaeology of Silbury Hill. So what's the main what's the main model? The main model is the sepulchral model, that all of these mounds that are being built during the Neolithic are burial places, the sepulchral model. And this is 
one way to celebrate our ancestors is to build a big mound. Now, the thing is, there's a big problem for them with this <laughs> because they've been digging in to Silbury Hill now for years. They've built and dug three tunnels. Uh, I've lost count of the number of cores they've cut into it and the number of cuttings they've come into it. But I, I do remember May in the year 2000 because it was just before I was about to take a field trip up to Silbury Hill. There'd been a lot of wet weather before that, but a massive hole appeared in the top of Silbury Hill. And here it is, you see it from above in May 2000. And there you see uh, an intrepid archeologist going down a rope, investigating this tunnel. Now, the, the latest tunnels that were built we were in 1968, where Atkinson, that's the man on the left in the picture there, is, is being interviewed by Mike Magnuson, a once famous television personality who was very keen on his Viking heritage. Um, but alongside them, the camera crew for BBC Two, a new television uh, uh, channel. And the archaeologist very cleverly got a lot of money from BBC Two to have prime television rights to do live television of archaeology in process. Now, Atkinson promised that he would backfill the tunnel, as did the two other tunnelers who went down into Silbury Hill. But they lied, because there's the picture of the same place and then when the archaeologists got bound down into it uh, in 2007, it took them seven years to get their act together to discover that the roofs of all of the tunnels were collapsing and destroying uh, the tunnels because, of course, the tunnels weren't built. The tunnels weren't built to hold all of that massive weight. And so they just collapsed. And then the void travelled up the hill until um, oh, oh, uh, there'd been this massive collapse that took place. But from the collapse, of course, they got the opportunity to go back, dig out the latest old tunnel that had collapsed, and then find a new, all of the details that were previously not detailed enough for modern archeological interpretation. And here you've got this complicated cross section. Now notice the center of the hill is here to the left of the diagram. And I'm going to show you in a minute my interpretations of how we understand all of those components in Silbury Hill. And here we're going to, but before we do, basically, this is the main interpretation given by Leary, Field and Marshall. Quote, there was no pre-existing concept for the final form of Silbury Hill in the heads of the builders. Now, when I first read this years ago, I, my head, my head sunk into my hands and I thought, what are they saying that they didn't know what they were doing? Now, see the next quote, <laughs> the upper organic mound, which might be considered an appropriate size structure for the everyday British Neolithic. <laughs> they're telling the people of the Neolithic how they should have built the hill. Just what was it that provided the catalyst to resume construction on such a huge scale. We can find no practical plan purpose for continuing to build such a monumental mound. Now this for me is the dead end for archeology span to make such a claim that they didn't know what they were doing. And because Leary, Field and Marshall can't find anything in their heads about why the Silbury Hill was built in the same way that it was, then it's not the Neolithic that's got nothing in their head. It's got to be Leary, Field and Marshall with nothing in their head. So what we're going to try and do is critique their bits of a model loosely connected, which they call their process model. This, by the way, is all uh, with thanks uh, to uh, Timoth Timothy Leary, isn't it? The uh, anthropologist. Um, uh, that's where they got all these ideas from. Um, the materiality model. 
No, what the builders were doing is they were playing with different types of material, chalk, gravel, uh, soil, clay, and they were just working out together as a joint exercise in how to build a mound. And we can explain Silbury Hill up until the first five metres, which brings us to the top of the upper organic mound. But after that, we don't know what they were doing. The remaining 32 metres on top of the initial five metres in height, before that chalk superstructure, what was going on was simply a material uh, mixture for the fun of it. But they come up with another little idea, which was that the, the process of building mounds is inherently interesting in keeping people together through their sociality, in working together on a joint exercise, this would build intimate bonds between all of those engaged in the, in the building, which would cement social relations and therefore provide memories uh, and new friendships and networks uh, by which uh, they would then be able to integrate their own society. Notice it says nothing, that model, about uh, how much material is involved or required. Uh, it doesn't say uh, anything about the form of the monument. It just says the, that the process of building it itself is inherently bonding and useful. Um, well, maybe, um, of course those things must happen when you're building, but that, the whole point is most of that experience is invisible to archaeology. That's why in, in anthropology and in archaeology, hopefully, we look out for ritual requirements of action. Uh, and, that, and that's not just a, 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 a passing experience of buildings, a mound. Uh, that's all about prescribed views, prescribed directions, uh, and prescribed phenomenological experiences. And then landscape placement, in it, namely, uh, that Silbury Hill has an intimate association with water. Yes, it does. And this is an important point that they're raising, and one I think that can be ex extended a lot further than they go in their own analysis. So what I'm now doing now, I'm doing my version through a cl close and detailed, and it's not too different from their version, but I do it in a different order, uh, because they just don't get the initial building stages of building Silbury Hill. But their experts do. The other 25 experts who give their expert opinion, they do provide this information which justifies the order that I'm now going to go through. Now these two lines in front of you, the top line is turf and soil, which is overlaying another layer called clay with flints, which is overlaying another area called lower chalk. Okay. Now, the first thing they did before anything else was there is they removed the turf and the soil, revealing the clay with flints material, the clay with flints. But then they did something amazing. They removed the flints from the clay. Now, you've got to remember this because this is essential. Because when I read the so-called explanation, for removing the flints. I couldn't understand it. And I had to read the book three times on how they possibly removed flints from clay. Now this clay is 50 meet, sorry, 50 centimeters to one meter deep below the turf and soil. And they removed the flints. Well, I was very impressed with that. Um, and therefore all you've got now is clay with flints without the flints immediately exposed and that's now going to be the base to Silbury Hill when they start building Silbury Hill. Now they then had in the centre of the mound which would be somewhere to the left of, to that line to the extreme left of that line there was a hearth remains of a, a hearth and a fire that had been there with scorched hazelnut shells in it and a small amount of charred pig bone. Now, remember, of course, that, um, uh, that uh, this area, Avebury and Stonehenge, or rather the West Kennet Palisades at Avebury and Durrington Walls at Stonehenge, 
are famous in archaeology for the pig feasts that must have been conducted there because thousands of pig bones have been found at the West Cannet Palisades uh, and at Durrington Walls. These are both mainly wooden monuments closely associated with the big rivers in their vicinity. We will return to that if I have time. However, the next step was they built a vast encircling ditch around at a, at a distance of 50 meters from the center. So there you can see the ditch at the end there. That ditch, six and a half meters deep by six and a half meters wide, that's enormous. Um, and there was this bank, encircling bank, and that was made out of chalk and clay the clay that has been revealed because the flints have been removed. And again, very strangely, they laid over the top of the reeds on top of the some, some reeds, which had been retted. It had been soaked in water for a long while. And they were reeds that had been laid over as a carpet all over the inner area inside the bank of the uh, encircling bank and ditch. So these, these are the strange beginnings. Before any mounds are built, these are the strange beginnings. The first mound is built is this one. It's 80 centimetres high and it's made from gravel. And the gravel was uh, yellow, orange and gold and flint mixed in into the gravel. So it was a stream bed that you would see in chalk country, if ever you do see a stream in chalk country. But gra a small gravel mound, which was about 10 meters wide and about nearly a meter high. Um, then again, very strangely, there was a mini mound. You can see it maybe there, just to the left of center of the line that you've got there, a mini mound, 30 centimeters high and 80 centimeters wide. And I ask you to look at that mini mound and especially its shape to see what it reminds you of. I will return to that in a minute. Now, uh, now, then after the mini mound, a layer of turf, soil and subsoil was put over the clay with flint. Uh, sorry, I've gone too fast. Very sorry, I'm backtracking now. Uh, there it is, there's the mini mound. I didn't mention before, did I? Look, there's a gravel mound, that's it, then a mini mound. And then there was a, that's it. The next mound above it is not the gravel mound. It's made from turf and soil and subsoil. Um, and the thing is, they argued that this was put on top to stabilize the gravel mound. I don't think that's true at all. We'll return to it. But this turf and soil and subsoil mound was, turf and subsoil that only comes from clay with flint. Remember that. It's called the lower organic mound. And that organic material, turf, soil and subsoil, was taken from clay with flint. And then pits were dug into the surface of the lower organic mound. Um, and this contained, inside the pits that were dug into the top of the lower in, in organic mound, was dark soil taken from the lower organic mound with some flint inside it and some tools. I know it's complicated, but you need the details. And if you're an anthropologist, uh, you, you, should, you will, I know, respect the details. Now, after that, another mound was built, and this was of turf, soil and subsoil, but only derived from chalk, okay? Not from clay with flint. And inside this upper organic mound was added unmodified sarsen boulders. And then immediately after that, um, 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 a bank was built around the upper organic mound, just as there is a bank alongside the deep pit, which is six and a half meters deep. And then after that, there was a chalk mound laid on top and then a, a a bank was put alongside the chalk mound. Then there was another mound of chalk built and alongside of that, uh, a, another bank. And finally, the final form of Silvery Hill, the final chalk building was done. 
Um, but notice that on the surface, they could dug it, they dug into the surface and the picture is up there uh, that you can see. Um, and then uh, you can see the revetments there of the chalk walls within which they pounded chalk flat to the level of the top revetments of chalk. But notice also that as the mound got bigger and bigger, look at the bottom right there, once the first um, uh, 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 ditch was um, filled over with chalk, another ditch was immediately dug alongside it. And then when that ditch was filled, another ditch immediately alongside it. The rule here for them, obviously, is there must be a ditch encircling the centre. That's an obvious ritual rule in the way that they built the monument. Right now, I've now given it its proper characteristics. And now I'm telling you that the clay with flints material is bright red and that the mounds that were built, the banks that were built around them as it grew up was therefore a mound of chalk and clay without the flints and therefore it's red and white. So we've got the gravel mound there as orange. We've got the, uh, the chalk, the, sorry, the turf and subsoil um, was from the, uh, from the clay soil. Uh, and then the light green was turf and subsoil, and that was from chalk. Yeah, so I've changed the color code in according to the composition of the mound. And I've shown the color code in appropriate to the banks. It's always white and red, uh, replicating the bottom of Silbury Hill, which is red, uh, and the top of Silbury Hill, which is the majority of the top, which is white chalk. Now, in case you don't believe me, there's a cross section of the of the of the uh, different loams, grass, subsoil, and then we get the clay with flints. And here, the flints have been removed, and there you can see it is bright red. Now, let's now look at a critique of this, because I've given you baldly how the talk, how the book goes. I was astonished that they did not tell you that the clay was bright red until page 251 of this 300 page book. In fact, they come up with a story that it wasn't red at all, it was white and grey. <laughs> and when you read the experts, <laughs> they point out that that was a late development after the hill had been built with the rotted, retted reeds <laughs> that were laid as a carpet over the top. And then they were compressed with thousands of tons of chalk and that turned the reeds white. Uh, so that it, when they laid those reeds, it wasn't white. So they're saying throughout the book, the base of the hill is a white, grey, dusty loam. It's not. It's bright red loam without flint. So the people who started writing the book, compared to the people who write the experts at the end, come up with a completely different characterization of the materials. And, con and considering that they're talking about the materiality model, I'm afraid they got away with it. And of course, they didn't with their colleagues, which explains why there must have been an enormous row about saying that the original land surface was white gray mush. It wasn't at all, it was bright red clay. So, uh, um, and uh, it, that, that this must be part of the ritual sy syntax of the hill. And they also point out that the sarsen boulders that they found at the bottom of the hill in the upper organic mound is in contrast to at the very top summit of the hill where worked boulders of sarsens are found at the top of the hill. And they claim, even Leary and the rest of them, they claim that this shows a contrast between unworked sarsens at the bottom and worked sarsens at the top. And I thought, hang on a minute, they could find no reason for building to the top of the hill. And that now they're giving a reason for the material transformation from the bottom to the top. So if there is a material symbolic context between unworked boulders and worked boulders from the bottom to the top, then if, that, if that's true, that's a ritual syntax. And it is evidence and proof that the builders showed foresight and were planning to build a big hill so they could put their worked 
boulders up the top. So I thought in that case, therefore, we must be able to find other examples where they're missing on the syntactical organization of materials in the way in which the builders built Silbury Hill. And I'm, I'm now gonna show you 10, which they just don't talk about at all. It's just amazing. If the organic mounds are the point, why, it, if they keep on going on about these two organic mounds, why? Because they're five meters high and no more. Uh, and this is how all the Neolithic mounds are built, which is true. So they're furious that they've found an enormous mound. There's no one buried in it. The sepulchral model doesn't work at all at Silvery Hill, which is why they keep digging tunnels. They're looking for King Sill, haven't found him. So the sepulchral model, the, the Silvery Hill is the greatest counterfactual to the sepulchral model because it's the hill that should have the biggest interment in it and it's got none and they can't find one and even though they keep digging tunnels. And then why did they build this ditch 20 meters away from the organic mounds if that's the only sensible mound to have? Why did they, why did they build it 50, 50 meters away from the center? It should be right up close to the organic mounds if they were not gonna plan it up high. So that, that doesn't work. And yet they say, they give the evidence to show you that this ditch was dug immediately the hill was being built before there was anything in there and so far away from the center. And then we've got the banks that are put regularly in place alongside of the edge of each major break in sequence of building the hill. And these banks are made of what? Red clay without the flints and white chalk. Well, the white represents the top and the red represents the bottle at the bottom. So therefore the syntax is repeated as we're going up and building the hill. Remember the red, remember the white. This is how we're gonna build the hill. Um, so, uh, so and, and why must they, all, and why the ditch again, it's not just the banks that are growing out with the Silbury Hill, it's the ditches as well. Why build them out all the time further and further away from the hill? Well, there's a major argument in, in archaeology now that all of the, near, the big Neolithic monuments have a ditch and a bank around them, which is why they're called henges. And the main model now is a good model because always before the model has been, well, we need a ditch to keep the peasants outside away. Uh, or we need a ditch because, I don't know, it might have a military purpose or military defence. Or we need a ditch to make a difference between the outside and the inside to give the inside some sanctity. Well, okay, some of them might work, they might, but the model that's becoming popular now, and which I think is very good, is that we need a ditch and a bank because the inside is so scary, we need to keep the dangerous spirits inside. And that's what the ditch and the bank are for. It's not to keep someone out from the outside, it's to protect us, those who are outside, if we're going to have the nerve to go inside it and inside this space where we've had this iridescent red clay revealed by the work that they've done. Um, and, uh, uh, and the last argument I've got is, if you recall that picture I showed you of a mini mound, I mean, that for me was the, the crowning piece of evidence because I don't really notice, but the shape of that mini mound was exactly the shape of the finished product of Silbury Hill. <laughs> it's a cone with a truncated top uh, and it's made from, guess who, red clay. <laughs> I mean, how daft can you be? So here we've got it. Uh, yeah, that's another thing. They call those chalk bits there. They call them banks. They're not banks. The banks are the little ones. That, go, that grow outwards. Banks are made from red clay and white chalk. These other ones have no red clay in them at all. It's the white chalk. The major division is between the red clay at the bottom and the chalk above the organic mounds. That's the major syntactical difference between the two. Um, yeah, in fact, the previous archeologists who were uh, Whittle and Atkinson called these so-called banks they called them Silbury 1 and Silbury 2. So you couldn't have clearer opposition than that from key, key leaders within British archaeology. 
And another thing is when you look at all of these mounds from the lower organic mound and the upper organic mound, even Silby 1 and Silby 2, you'll notice they're the same shape as the final form of Silby Hill. Um, and they're centered, they're all nested, they're all symmetrical. Clearly they're working to a plane. None of this is a materiality model playing with different materials. In fact, this red clay, how long have I been talking? <laughs> okay, I'm going to rush on. I'm not going to deal with this one. because There's an example of red chalk, over, sorry, red clay overlaying chalk to show you. Um, now, uh, I'm, I'm not going to do these details because I need to get onto the astronomy uh, to show uh, how it all works. But notice the main division I'm saying is um, the difference between red at the bottom, white at the top, clay at the bottom, uh, between the top and the lower mounds. So I'm saying these are opposites. We can find that they're ritual opposites in some way and that they have been unified in contradiction. And can we find it from? Well, we need a bit more evidence to be able to do that. Um, but we've clearly reached the limits of the process model because there's so many things wrong with it you just can't stay with it at all. You might be able to pick up a few interesting things there, as I have from looking at the contradictions, but we do expect of any scientific model, we expect coherence. We do not expect incoherence, which is what we've got. Uh, and uh, they make another bizarre claim. They claim that Silbury Hill cannot be seen from any other part of the Avery Monument complex. Uh, and frankly, I, I don't know what to say to this because it's just not true and everyone knows it. And I'm amazed they've put in black and white the claim that Silbury Hill is at, and I'm now quoting verbatim, is at the bottom of a hill which cannot be seen from the rest of Avebury. It's a lie, I'm afraid. Uh, and I know why. Uh, and we got onto that at the end. But 300 years ago, Stukeley showed it wasn't the case. He said that they are all obscurely visible to each other but that's not the same as invisible because Silbury Hill can be seen from very odd positions to present very odd views to Sil of Silbury Hill when it is seen. So let's going to start now looking at this. Um, we would expect, here we go, now uh, I'm going to just start with the obvious, uh, here we go. Am I arguing that the red clay is a blood signifier? Yes, I am. Uh, I am going to argue that. Now, I'll, and I'll give a few layers of reasons. Uh, and when we've got to the end of the astronomy, we've got an enormous reason to go with it all. I mean, why did they remove the flints? Well, it's obvious to display the red. Um, so they didn't want it all pockmarked with flints poking through. They want clear vibrant red and that's what they got with the clay. Um, now by the way this same clay is used elsewhere at Avebury and when I first le learnt this many years ago I didn't know what to make of it but it was placed alongside the obelisk in four pits that have been uh, dug right alongside the obelisk and Alongside these four pits, there were big deposits of this red clay right next to the grave of an adult Neolithic man. I didn't know that until I started critiquing this book. And also along the West Kennet Avenue, there are four stones at the base of which there are adult mouths and youths who have been cut to death. And this red clay was used alongside them. So I've now got uh, three bits of big archaeology evidence to say, yes, it is worth looking into this issue of whether it's blood or not. Well, that's the first one. Have we got any more? Uh, well, the, bank, the banks signify blood with red clay. And this, the bank is therefore encircling and underneath, it is the base 
to what's in the middle. So if we can say this signifies blood, by the way, we don't know what blood yet at the moment, but if it's signifying blood, this is confirmed by the red and white banks that go around the center, which is a center of blood on the red clay. So as I said before, it could be to, it's, it supports that argument about enclosing powerful and dangerous forces. Um, and where else do we find? Well, we find in a little while that in fact, Silvery Hill is connected to the West Kennet Palisades. Uh, and the West Kennet Palisades are known as a place of pig slaughter and pig feasts. And I also learned recently, which I didn't know, because these pigs were slaughtered through archery, through arrows, where in masses they killed pigs together all in one go. But I didn't know this. When a pig is slaughtered, it has an agonized scream. This is a bit much, folks. And this scream sounds like a human scream. I didn't know this, but I found this out recently and I have to add it because um, it's shown that this is the archaeology of the West Kennet Palisades. Also, if you don't um, cut an animal, while a, a pig, while it's alive and drain its blood out, and then uh, if you don't do that and then kill it, its blood will be flushed when it's dead. So when you cook the pig, it will still have blood flowing in it because you didn't flush the pig beforehand. So it's not just a pig feast, it's a blood feast. Is what's going on at the West Canet Palisades. And there's another bit, I'm sorry to impose this on you, but it's facts. Um, the pig feasts, the archeologists always say it was a very wasteful procedure, this pig feast, because they left whole cuts of meat. And I, I, for years, I went along with this. I'd say, yeah, there'd just be meat everywhere and there'd be wasteful cuts. They didn't tell me, and I only learned this by reading very carefully Alice Dare Whittle's book. They didn't eat the whole left side of the pig. <laughs> the whole left side of the pig was decided, discarded and they would only eat the, uh, the right side of the pig. Well, yes, that is wasteful, but it's also syntactical, left versus right. And again, in archaeology, in, sorry, in anthropology, we have lots of evidence that left versus right is female versus male. Um, and uh, the biggest non-archaeology evidence I can give for this is the Medusa myth, because the Medusa, um, Athena, who is a scab, to women's collectivity, uh, Athena drained Medusa's blood and collected the blood from the right hand side of her body and put it in a vial. And then she collected her blood from the left side of Medusa's body and collected that in a left vial. And the blood in the right hand side from Medusa would cure any illness, whereas the blood from the left side of Medusa is fatal, venomous, and will kill everyone. So it's left versus right. Once patriarchal concepts are brought into play, that's blood seep. So I'm, I'm not adding it up, but I'm getting to about eight or nine reasons so far. And is the clay a blood signifier? Um, uh, an enormous external ditch. Has the hill got bigger? Yeah. Well, it's just a uh, repetition, sorry, about having to enclose it to keep the, to keep the inside safe for the, those outside. So I've, that was my critique of the materiality model. Uh, and I'm not going to dwell on the process model at all because I've got one answer to it. When you're studying monuments, you're studying prescribed views, prescribed phenomenological experience. How do you feel when you're walking through these routes that they are telling you you must walk through? How do you feel about that? It's called landscape archaeology uh, and the process model, what people experienced on the day when they were doing the dig is not accessible. It's not accessible, the process model, to ritual walking and ritual experiences. So therefore it cannot work. Uh, so forget it. Uh, and now I'm going to go on to the next bit. And now I'm going to begin with a bit of the astronomy that we're going to
deal with. Now, up until this stage, when you read the book, you would never know that Silbury Hill was part of this monument complex. You'd never know it. They don't tell you. In fact, it can't be seen. It's hidden. Well, yes and no. That, that's the point. And yes and no is good. Because if you look, number one there on the diagram is West Kennet Palisades, where they are. Number two is Silbury Hill. Number three is, uh, is called uh, Fox Covert, which is the beginning of Beckhampton Avenue. Number five is at the, where you go over the River Winterbourne. Number eight is where you get to the southern inner circle. Number nine is where you're in West Kennet Avenue. Number 10 is where there's a break in West Kennet Avenue. And number 12 is where we're at the, uh, uh, oh, Jesus. Sanctuary. Um, where is it? The sanctuary. There you go. Thanks, Chris. The sanctuary. Okay. Now, um, you can see Silbury Hill from one part of the West Kennet Palisades, but not a second part, which is position one. You can see a bit of Silbury Hill. When you get to um, Fox Covert, which is where you really start your journey, start your ritual, you can see Silbury Hill, but just the top bit of it. When you get to number five there, which is um, over the bridge, over the River Winterbourne, you can see Silbury Hill, which is just the top bit of it. But when you're walking along Beckhampton Avenue, you only see it for a little while. And then when it gets behind Folly Hill, you can't see it. Then again, you see it again at position five. You don't see it again until you're at position eight from the southern inner circle. You don't see it again down the avenue at all until you get to, um, to the same place where I've forgotten the name. Sanctuary, other uh, sanctuary. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> uh, and then not until you get, do you see it again until you're at the um, West Kennet Palisades. Okay. Okay, here's Avebury, the Avebury Circle. Um, and it shows clearly the unusual location of the Avebury Circle because all around it, there's clear, flat, open spaces. And the question to ask of the builders is why did you build the avenues and the sanctuary and Silbury Hill amongst all of these surrounding hills? Why didn't you just go and build everything on this flat open space just to the north of Avery Circle? It couldn't have been that you weren't aware of it. That's where you lived. Um, so why did you build them the way that you did? So I designed a research uh, uh, exercise for myself where I worked out how else they could have built but chose not to do so. Um, and then I've, these are... I can then build a proxy population of alternative Avebury monuments. Uh, and then I said, I'll, I'll choose any pair of avenue combinations with either Silbury Hill in the south or Silbury Hill in the north. And I'd work out what felt different when I walked them. It was that simple. What can I see? What can't I see? What does it feel like? Uh, and I came to the discovery, which hadn't been apparent to me before, that the Beckhampton Avenue and the West Kennet Avenue provide the largest number of possible interruptions to the views of Silbury Hill than any other combination, okay? And that these on-off interruptions as you walk around the prescribed avenues uh, and, and places and the monuments to visit on this prescribed uh, ritual route uh, provided just a few simple views, uh, although the views might be considered as rather strange. So, oh, it's not very again. What? And yeah, here we go. Um, and the uh, West Kennet Palisades. And the top left there in the Ordnance Survey map, you've got Silbury Hill in the top left, and you've got the West Kennet Palisades 
you'll notice they're right close by. Um, and the river Winterbourne goes past Silbury Hill. It becomes the name, the River Kennet, just down at Swallowhead Spring there. Uh, and there you can see uh, the West Kennet Palisades, which are this structure superimposed on re in red on the Ordnance Survey map. And here on green, which shows more clearly the strange shape of the West Kennet Palisades. Uh, and these were the monument of wood. Uh, they were uh, uh, coterminous. They were current with the with uh, all of the Avery other monuments, but well built about 2004 between 2400 and 2300 BC, which is when Silbury Hill had just been finished. Uh, is when the West Kennet Palisades were away. So when I say that's the Avery Monument complex, they were all there alongside each other. Now, we, we're going to have to start doing the astronomy. Um, notice that uh, we have, don't look at the, the bold dashed lines, look at the continuous lines which have arrows at the end of them. And in the middle of each group of three, there is a summer solstice position. If you want an alignment on the sun at summer solstice, uh, those are the solstice, sunset or sunrise horizon positions. They're stable. Um, and uh, they're accurate. So it, it won't be too much trouble to find them and to set a monument up that would be aligned on the sun. In the top right there, summer solstice sunrise, which is where everyone thinks Stonehenge is aligned on. It's not. But summer solstice sunrise is at 42 degrees above the eastern horizon, the eastern alignment. Um, and then down in the southeast, in the bottom right hand corner, Summer winter solstice sunrise is at minus 42 degrees, 42 degrees below the eastern horizon. Uh, down in the bottom left, winter solstice minus 42 degrees below uh, uh, the western horizon. Top left there, summer solstice sunset, 42 degrees above the western horizon at summer solstice. So with the sun, it's dead simple. There's just four horizon positions. With the moon, there is eight because the moon spirals around the earth. It doesn't circle the earth. And in its spiral, its extremes change. <clears throat> so one extreme is called the major standstill of the moon, where the amplitude on the horizon for the extreme positions of the moon are the greatest. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then over the course of 9.3 years, the extreme limits to the moon's horizon range reduces, reduces and reduces until it gets down to just 31 degrees above or above the eastern or western horizon or um, 34 degrees below the east or west horizon. So, you, so these are the northern major and the southern major horizons, which are, they, they then take 19 years to return to the major standstill horizon position on the moon. But between the two major standstills, after 9.3 years, there's the minor standstill of the moon, northern minor, uh, southern minor, northern minor moon set, southern minor moon set. Um, so uh, you can, because the sun is doing this every year, moving backwards and forwards across the horizon, when the moon is at either the major or the minor moon set, it stays at that horizon area for about two years, nearly two years. Uh, and when I say nearly, I mean plus or minus 1.5 degrees within that area, within that region. And they don't regularly flitter backwards and forwards in this minus and plus 1.5 degrees. They're all over the place. They're almost random, the way in which they flicker within this three degree range on the horizon. Right, that's that. Now, that's the, that's the alignments that you can possibly have on the moon. Now look at the bold dashed line. Those are all of the views that you have of Silbury Hill when you're walking along the avenues and walking through Avery Circle and walking right round uh, to, uh, uh, the West Kennet Palisades, those are all the views that you have uh, of Silbury Hill. And notice they do not coincide 
with Labour stands still, <laughs> major standstill or minor standstills of the moon or of the sun solstices. They're completely separate views that you get of Silver Hill, which are separate from any of the moon's alignments or the sun's alignments. Uh, so that would be a surprise to many people. Now, the next complication, of which there are many, I'm afraid, on the moon, the next complication is if you put a stick in the ground, stood anywhere, stood in a particular position where you will be able to line up with the moon rise or the moon set on the local horizon. If you did that, then if you waited nearly a month, a sidereal month, in fact, of 27.3 days, when the moon came back round to that horizon position on the moon, it wouldn't be the full moon again. And the reason is that the moon goes round the earth, but as the moon is going round the earth, the earth is going round the sun. And because the earth is circling the sun a bit, qu a, a bit quicker, sorry, because the moon is circling the earth quicker than the earth is circling the sun, it takes another 2.2 days for the sun, the moon and the earth all line up again to create a full moon. Therefore, the moons that you will see, the lunar phase that you see, each time you're looking to that circle, will always be a lunar phase 2.2 days earlier than you saw the one before. And here you see, this, this is from a guy called Morrison, who used to be an astronomer royal at the Greenwich Observatory. But you'll see the way he computed it, uh, and he shows that the moon's phases go backwards on any lunar standstill. This is true of the minor standstill, it's true of the major standstill. So for a lunar alignment, the moon goes backwards. Right, here's, oh, here we go again. And here's Avery, and you'll see that uh, the main alignment of the southwest there is on winter solstice sunset and the southern major standstill moon sets. Um, uh, and they're both pointed in the same direction. So therefore, if the sun is behind the moon, that means it's dark moon uh, and you can, and uh, that, that means it will obviously be a dark moon. Therefore, the alignments of the sun and the moon in Avery Circle are concentrated on dark moon. Therefore, Avery Circle is a place of a dark moon ritual. Stonehenge is as well. So when we all go there for summer solstice sunrise, we're going at exactly the wrong time. We, go, we should be going at winter solstice sunset at dark moon, which is the start of the longest, darkest night possible. And therefore, the greatest number of stars that can be seen and the greatest variety of myths that could be told. Okay, now here's uh, West Kennet Avenue. You can get alignments across the avenue according to the direction and way you are facing. John North first showed this uh, and it's, and sorry, that's, there it is, the West Kennet Avenue. John North shows that you can get lunar and solar alignments across it. Uh, and the archeologist, uh, Alexander Keeler, showed a very strange thing about position 30B. There was no pair of stones. For one of them, no stone had ever been placed there. Uh, uh, no, no stone, uh, but thousands of, of flint tools and a flint and a, not a flint axe but an axe um, uh, and thousands and thousands of flint cutting tools were, were placed there. At the top pillar that you see there, the one that's pointed, that did have a stone beside it which represents another place but the one with the flat top there, which is an interesting choice of design, the one with the flat top there never had a stone placed there. Keeler couldn't understand it why did they never put a stone there, he says. So he decided he would put a stop stone there, uh, which is odd. Uh, but nevertheless, he put a stone there and he says, it's very odd. I don't know how to explain it, why they didn't have a stone there. Well, right next to that stone, there was another stone. An adult man had been cut to death and he was right next to the instruments of death, cutted instruments and an ax. And he was cut to death, as were five other adults and youths further along the avenue as they're approaching the dark moon ritual at the Avery Circle. So, 
30B. Why 30B? 30B is 29 and a half pairs of stones along the avenue. Well, hang on, 29 and a half pairs of stones. There are 29 and a half moons and days in every month, in the synodic month. There are 29 and a half days. So e every archaeoastronomer knows that. Well, why 29 and a half days? Well, we already know that from the alignments, every henge was a dark moon place of ritual. Well, if we've just left a dark moon place of ritual and we go into a place which is 29 and a half stones, pairs of stones later, and is also a place of death, and we've got cut installs there, then this also must be a place of death. Or you could say it the other way around. You could say, well, I know that position 29 and a half is a dark moon place, and that will mean that going back 29 and a half stones back to the Avery Circle, that will mean that the Avery Henge is a dark moon place. You can have it which way round you want, but either way you end up with the deniable conclusion that we are dealing with a ritual that's focusing on dark moon. Right now, here are the views that we're going to see of, uh, of uh, the Ape Silbury Hill when we see it. Um, and uh, here we're looking at Silbury Hill from the start of Beckhampton Avenue. Uh, and it happens to be at 16 degrees north of west. Uh, no, sorry, south of west, 16 degrees south of west. Uh, and we just see the top terrace and that top terrace was cleared and it was clear pristine white chalk because the terrace had been cut down by the repetition of many rituals. So this is the first view we see and it is therefore waning crescent moon on the eastern horizon. Crescent moon can only be seen when it's waning when it's on the eastern horizon. That's because the moon travels widdershins to the left anti-clockwise across the sky and as it's getting closer and closer to the sun and as the sun is rising up in the morning for a few hours at best you'll see waning crescent moon on the east horizon and then as it's moving up the sun is moving with it and soon as the sun rises the blinding light of the sun will wash out the light the weak reflected light on Silbury Hill or on the moon indeed and waning crescent moon will disappear. So anyone who knows the moon knows that if you see waning crescent you can only see it on the eastern horizon and that's the only view you can get from this prescribed route of Beckhampton Avenue along the avenue routes. We've now gone further along the avenue to the River Winterbourne. We are crossing the River Winterbourne notice and now we see Silbury Hill uh, and it is below, its summit, level flat summit is in line with the background horizon. Now if we're staying with the view that this is, this is simulating the moon, well yes that's good because now the moon is in the underworld because the moon is below the background horizon. If the moon is below the horizon then it must be dark moon. Well of course it must because it is now 80 degrees south of west. Well, the moon can never be seen 80 degrees south of west on the southern horizon because the maximum range of the moon is 54 degrees south of west on, on, in this earth. But if you're in the underworld, well, then you're lucky and you're dead because then you can see the moon in the underworld as it is moving through the underworld to then get to the western horizon. Now we're at the centre of the southern inner circle at Avebury and now we can see Silbury Hill on the far right hand tip peeping over the edge of Waden Hill. So it's again it's the terrace, the white chalk terrace but now it's 77 degrees south of east. No sorry, 77. Yes south of east, sorry, south of east. Um, so but then you never see the moon beyond 54 degrees south of east or west. So this must be waxing crescent moon as it's moving towards the western horizon to rise. And then as we, now I'm at the sanctuary and there I see uh, Silbury Hill is flat level top in line with the background horizon um, and therefore level with the background horizon, therefore still in the underworld. But now it's on the far 
west of the horizon. So soon it must be rising to be waxing crescent moon. OK, uh, it's far easier to do that and understand it when someone like me or otherwise is talking at it and explaining it. But here we've got another alignment, the last alignment in the West Kennet Palisades. And now we, we see the moon uh, rising uh, above the stockade. Um, and the stockade is the West Kennet Palisades. Uh, and they've, they've done it so that only again can you see the top terrace north of the horizon. And I'll come back to what that is in a minute. OK, so but notice it's doing the same distorted or rather uh, 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 cropped, cropped images of Stilby Hill, only allowing you to see certain places. Um, now, remember the moon's phases go in reverse when it's an alignment. But we're now going to look at the West Kennet Palisades. Uh, and you can see that when we're coming from the sanctuary, we're coming from the right and moving to the left, which is that arrow moving there, pointing to the left. OK, so that's the route that we would have taken coming from West Kennet Avenue, then to the sanctuary, then from the sanctuary into the West Kennet Palisades. Notice the route you have to take through the river. You have to immerse yourself in the river. That enclosure too of the West Kennet Palisades is a double ring of stockades, wood that is butted up close to each other. It is also thought by the archaeologists that an additional ply of alternative horizontal timbers were laid to completely block out all vision to either the west, the east, the north or the south. Everything was blocked out. Well, remember, we've come from the sanctuary and that was anticipating the emergence of waxing crescent moon coming out of the underworld, remember. But now we've gone into enclosure two and we've now been completely obscured from anyone, any site, and we're walking in a river at the same time. And then when we come out, we come into enclosure one, which is that one there. Ignore that other labeling for the moment. When we're in this other uh, 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 enclosure here, enclosure two, the view that we have of uh, Silver Hill is this view. It's the view of the top of Silbury Hill. And here it is 40 degrees north of west. Now, 40 degrees north of west is the alignment on the northern minor standstill moon set. Uh, and notice that that follows exactly in sequence with all of the other alignments that we've seen when we are following the synodic cycle. So therefore, when we are at the beginning at uh, 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 Fox Covert, we saw waning crescent moon. Then we got to the river Winterbourne and we saw the moon that has just set into the underworld and we were crossing a river. And then we moved into the Avery Circle and then we saw uh, the moon that has set when we're in the southern inner circle um, and then that was then an, uh, a moon that was on the uh, 77 degrees south of east, uh, which was therefore in the underworld because the moon in this world never reaches so far south. Uh, and then we moved down to the sanctuary uh, and we saw the moon there in line with the background horizon about to go through and come out on the western horizon as waxing crescent moon. Um, and then uh, finally we come into the sanct, into the West Kennet Palisades, and we see uh, the uh, moon on the, sorry, here we go. Then we see the, the moon on the northern minor standstill. Right now, here's the problem with all of this, besides understanding it. The problem is when the moon comes into, goes through the river, through the completely blocked out palisade number one, one 
and then into palisade number two, we are expecting to see the moon as waxing crescent moon, just arriving. And we do see the moon as waxing crescent moon. But I've also said it is aligned on the northern minor standstill. Now, I've also said before that when you get the northern minor standstill and the summer solstice, because there is a summer solstice alignment of the West Canic Palisades, it will always be dark moon. Well, yes, it will. But that's not what the moon is doing in the West Canic Palisades. As long as we've walked through the first enclosure to the second enclosure, we can all see it and we can say, ah, yeah, that's waxing crescent moon. That's what we were expecting. And we were expecting that because the first enclosure we were in was completely dark. And therefore, we ourselves were walking through the last bit of dark moon journey, the underworld, the last bit of the underworld journey. And when I come out, I see exactly what I expect. I see the waxing crescent moon. So how could I possibly then re-enter the West Kennet Palisades at these points of entry? There's another point of entry into the West Kennet Palisades. And it's only from these two outer circles, because from one of the outer circle, there is an alignment on the sun. And from another of the circles, there is an alignment on the moon. So if you've got a lunar alignment at the summer solstice, it cannot be waxing crescent moon. It will have to be dark moon. So it looks like Lionel has driven himself up a blind alley here when I'm, my concepts uh, go into reverse suddenly when we're trying to do a circuit back round the Avery monuments, back round to Fox's cover. But aha, <laughs> as you can imagine, that's not the case because these people know what they're doing. The alignment on the summer solstice is actually an alignment made in a way that is through the bottom outer circle there has an alignment on the sun, but it's a broken alignment that can't be seen. There is an intervening hill between that outer big double circle there and it can't quite be seen. And the only and the only way that you can see it is moving over to these other monuments, over to the other side of the hill, which is then aligned on summer solstice. And what this alignment here is on is on a few days before the summer solstice. Um, and it breaks the alignment to then make a summer solstice alignment such that what you will see out there is the sun not coinciding with the moon. And what will you see? Well, well you'll, you'll, a few days before the solstice, you do see uh, you, 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 the, the summer solstice is not there and the ritual is not ready to start. But if you start it earlier, according to the sun, and walk in to the monument and the West Canet Palisades before you, you experience the summer solstice, you then walk straight into the earlier enclosure here, which is enclosure number one, the one on the top right there, and you then see dark moon after you've seen the summer solstice and the crescent moon, after you've seen the crescent moon, because during a lunar standstill, because of the reversal of lunar phases, if you look back on the left there to the diagram, you'll see where wa waning crescent moon is. Waning crescent moon, uh, sorry, sorry, Waxing crescent moon, in the top left diagram there for the northern minor standstill, waxing crescent moon precedes dark moon because the lunar phases go in reverse for a lunar standstill alignment. And this monument is designed for the next step to go round the circle of lunar trays, sees all of those moons that we saw before, not going round in their correct sequence, the synodic sequence, they're now going round in their reverse sequence, in the lunar alignment sequence, in which all of the alignments and views of the moon will be seen, will be correctly in reverse. So seeing waxing crescent moon on the western horizon is because waxing crescent moon comes before dark moon, not after dark moon, in a reversed sequence of lunar phases. Solarization of the moon every 27.3 days. It goes in reverse. Now, this is why I've used the word chiral. Chiral means 
the exact opposite, the exact reverse meaning. So this moon goes round twice in the Avebury monuments. It does also for Stonehenge, but that's for the paper after the next paper. But here, the Chiral moon is referring to the way in which lunar alignment reverse lunar phases. And they've designed a monument to simulate both the movement of the moon in its synodic phases and to reverse the moon in its uh, standstill alignment phases. So, we found looking at the internal properties of the monument, there's a contradiction between the top and the bottom, between the white and the red. Now we found there's a contradiction between the synodic lunar phases and the reversed sidereal lunar phases. Therefore, there is a formal equality between the ritual syntax of the internal properties of the hill and the external properties of the hill. They, they reverse each other. Uh, there's a reversal inside the hill between red and white and the reverse outside the hill between the synodic moon and the sidereal moon. That means, therefore, there's a formal identity between inside and outside. Now, uh, this suggests to me that I am now allowed to use the word female blood, female menstruation, because in the first journey round, that journey is to simulate 29.5 days. Well, that is the female blood cycle. So now I, I can actually not just say it's blood and it could be the blood of a bull or the blood of a man. I can now say, no, actually, right down there, I've got a 29.5 day cycle and a 29.5, because of what was found out about the lunar aspects, and a 29.5 day cycle that coincides with blood. That can only mean, only mean it's a female blood cycle. Now, when we go around the opposite direction with the sidereal, sidereal cycles of the moon, that reverses the blood flow. Well, how can we reverse a blood flow? Well, remember the Avery circle takes place during the major standstill and the West Kennet Palisades minor standstill takes place 9.3 years later. Well, which blood flow happens nine years apart? It's certainly not women's blood flow that does that, but it's almost universal in traditional male rituals, initiation rituals, that initiation ritual must be accompanied by some flow of blood or by some substitute for blood, like red ochre, okay? And also that male initiation rituals don't happen every month. They very frequently happen every eight or nine years, or they very frequently happen 19 years as well. For example, uh, there is some historical evidence that initiation of the Druids took 19 years, for example. Now, if therefore we can find a blood ritual through, ritual, through rituals that either take place 29.5 days and or they take place every 19 years or 19.5 years or 18.6 years or 9.3 years, we can say with a great deal of, of uh, validity that they are almost certainly male rituals. Uh, and that's why I call them reified rituals, because uh, they've been taken over by another uh, aspect. Okay, I'm now got to talk about the ritual connection, and then I'll be at the end of my talk. Okay. Just having a drink of water as I talk. So what about the water theory? Remember, once the red clay without flints had been revealed, they then put reeds over the soil that was revealed. They laid these reeds flat, not over a green field, which is, by the way, the traditional due way of retting reeds, but over the red clay that had been revealed. Um, and on top of the retted reeds, um, they placed 
a gravel mound, uh, which was just uh, uh, 80 centimetres high or something. Yes, 80 centimetres high. Uh, and by the way, Silbury Hill has a brook running alongside it called Beckhampton Brook. So, red clay, retted cut reeds, gravel mound. The base of the mound is at 157 metres above Ordnance Datum. And this Beckhampton uh, brook is at about 154, 55 metres above Ordnance Datum. At winter, floods swamp the ditch, and it's called a system by the archaeologists around the hill. Uh, uh, and the young initiate would have to wave through the River Kennet, or as it used to be called, the River Cunnet, to enter and move through the West Kennet Palisades. And uh, someone I know has done some lovely research. And this is how his reproduction of how the local rivers and springs would have sprung into life during the winter months. And notice there is a lake around Silbury Hill which then flows into the River Winterbourne, which then joins the River Kennet, which then goes all the way through the West Kennet Palisades. Now the West Kennet Palisades are obviously the place where the, the young neophytes are being initiated into their dark moon rituals. And of course, when they come from the West Kennet Avenue through the North Kennet Spring and Brook, and then into the River Kennet, they are wading through a strongly flowing river. Um, and, and today, in the Kennet is not strong, strong flowing, but in those days, it would have been a torrent of water that would have been coming down straight into the West Kennet Palisades. Now, of course, here's the link. The Silbury Hill would have been flooded all in its lower sections. So the blood from Silbury Hill as it would have been seen in the secret knowledge of the male initiation cult would have been flowing in this river, flowing through the West Kennet Palisades, flowing all around the bodies of the shaman priests uh, and the neophytes that were being initiated through these monuments. Why would they have these really fly blood rituals? Why would they be doing this? Well, of course, the monument builders are cattle herders. They're doing a bit of hunting and gathering. They're doing a, a tiny bit of planting, but not much. Mainly they're cattle herders. And cattle herders have taken over from hunter and gatherers um, and therefore now bride service has been replaced by bride price. With bride service, a hunter has to hunt for 15, 20 years for his wife, if, she, if he wants to keep her as a wife, otherwise she'll walk off. Whereas if you've got a uh, bride price, a man buys a wife in return for a gift of cattle. If she doesn't like him, there's a disincentive to stay with him because otherwise her relatives will have to return the cattle. Therefore, women become more and more isolated with the growth of pastoralism and agriculture. And so this is a society moving in to one that doesn't want the memories of the moon. When they're building Avery and Stonehenge, there's a very strong memory still of the moon. But now it's a strong memory of the moon that has to be educated against. And this malinitiation educates the young men that their moon is not the monthly moon of blood of women, it's the monthly moon of a solarized moon, a solarized moon that can now capture it for women's, sorry, for, for men's rituals that take place every 10 or 20 years. That's, that's it. Um, uh, we're live now. And um, uh, as I understand it, Lionel's not doing Q and A, as I understand it. Um, and, and any questions need to be on the chat. But I think what we move over straight away now to is Fabio. You've got something to say to us and also to Lionel. Is that right? Um, yeah, we, we can do that now if you want. I think it's probably best, isn't it? Can I have permission to share my screen? You certainly can. Um, so, very efficient. I mean, uh, 
<laughs> Thank you, Lionel. I mean, that, that was fantastic. And I, I have a, a number of things that I will put in the chat box when I finish speaking. But um, a couple of weeks ago, Chris basically contacted me to say that we should use this opportunity to, to celebrate Lionel. Oh, and he asked whether we would be um, open to make a, uh, the first public announcement of a couple of things we're working on that relate very direct, directly with Lionel. And um, I'm very happy to announce for the first time publicly that Liz Henty and myself are working on a book, an edited volume of essays in honor of Lionel that we're calling Solarizing the Moon. And we, we oops, we, we're doing this primarily to celebrate Lionel and his contribution to the field of archaeoastronomy more generally and um, highlight Lionel's influential body of work, which not only focused on, as we have just seen, uh, reframing the narratives about British prehistoric monuments, but actually Lionel's contribution extends far beyond that because he has provided us with innovative ways to approach and think about archaeology and about archaeoastronomy. And this has impacted on a number of our colleagues and students, which we are gathering together in this volume, and some of them um, are actually in the room with us today. And this is the table of contents. I'm not going to read this out, but I'll leave it in there. Um, the book's going to be published by Archeo Press. We're still working on finalizing some of the chapters, but we're hoping that it will be out, or at least it will be finished and off to Archeo Press for them to print within the next few couple of months maximum. And I hope you see that we, this basically captures a lot of, of, of what Lionel's work has been about. There's one section on theory, there's one section on anthropology and human origins with lots of names you'll recognize, and there's one section on prehistory and megalithic monuments. The second thing we want to announce is that, I'm gonna move the slides now, can share this with whoever wants it later. Uh, there's been um, a series of online lectures for the past six months, co-organized by uh, the Journal of Skyscape Archaeology that uh, Liz Henty and myself edit, as well as the Sophia Center and the Sophia Center Press that are run by Nick Campion, who is with us in the room from the University of Wales Trinity St. David. And as part of this lecture series uh, we have been which, which we have charged for we are turning the profits into a um, collection of grants for students and we have decided that one of these would be the Lionel Sims award for student contributions that bridge the gap between anthropological theory and skyscape archaeology this is a thousand pound award that will be open to any student of archaeology anthropology or cultural astronomy and it will be given for a piece of written research, which we then hope to publish in the Journal of Skyscape Archaeology. And we've decided to name it after Lionel to recognize his commitment to education in cultural astronomy, as well as his focus on four field anthropology, as Lionel so um, calls it, with skyscapes at the center. Now, don't ask us for details yet. We will be announcing these in due time. There will be a website with application forms, criteria, deadlines, etc. But I just wanted to share that with this group as well. That's it, Chris. Fantastic. Marvellous. <laughs> um, Brilliant. Brilliant. I, now, I, I'm not quite sure what to do um, because I, I, I'm sure everyone's bursting with questions um, and comments. Um, and if it's all right with Lionel, I suppose we just carry on for another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Lionel, do you want to say anything? Yes, very much so. Thank you. Fabio, thank you. That's fa and Liz, thank you. That's fantastic. The award idea is brilliant. Uh, not particularly because it's got my name, but because it encourages students to engage with this discipline, which is going to go everywhere in archaeology. It is going to just completely swamp archaeology in the, in the years to come. And therefore, people uh, who are starting research careers this, this grant was uh, be an another wonderful incentive to think hard about this. So that's very good. Another thing I noticed is that Kim Malville is going to be part of this book in my honour. And if this persuades Kim to accept the minor standstill of the moon,
then my life will have been worth living. So thank you very much. <laughs> Brilliant, Fabio. Thank you. You're very welcome, Lionel. Um, I think you will be surprised with Kim's chapter. We haven't seen it yet, but he keeps telling us that we are going to be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell him to hurry up, because I want to know what he says. <laughs> We're doing our best <laughs> to get it onto the shelves. <laughs> um, so give me some guidance, friends and comrades and colleagues. What, what are we doing now? Um, uh, really, it's, I, we don't want to put under any pressure. There is an interesting I mean... question. There are some interesting questions, perhaps worth trying to say something. I don't know. Uh, yes, there are quite John, some. John's uh, one about the red, possibly referring to the moon in a full eclipse, moon, full moon eclipse. Yeah, that's very good observation. I quite agree with it. Who's saying that? Um, John Cox. John yeah. Cox, who I know. John Cox, I yeah. know. <laughs> Hi, Hi, John. Lionel. Hi, John. Hi. <laughs> Fantastic. I, just... I agree with you at last, John. <laughs> very good yeah no very good quite right Camilla do you want to read out any more from this from the chat and um, John's also asking for examples of nine or 19 year male ritual cycles have we oh, got some oh yeah well uh, Maurice Godelier the Baruya um, uh, there's a, a start. I gave one much closer to home. I gave the uh, um, uh, the Druids 19 year initiation cycle. Yeah. Uh, John, I, Some, th that would be another be. subject in itself. That would be another talk in itself. Yeah, okay. okay. Thanks. There will be some African mm. pastoralist age sets, possibly. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, somebody's talking about Hamlet's Mill. I'm not sure about that one. Yeah, I, I start shaking when I hear about Hamlet's Mill. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what to say about any of that. I never reached the end of uh, reading all that stuff. Um, I don't know what to say about it. I really don't. It's, I, I've spent the last 30 years of my life in my research trying to cautiously and verifiably come into uh, uh, an understanding of, of these monuments. Because I, I went to um, uh, UCL, to the archaeology department and anthropology department there, to do a master's in anthropology and archaeology, um, to try and make sure that I would be able to reach out to scholars who I knew, I knew would be dead set against any astronomy. But I also knew that if Chris Knight's model was correct, the first astronomers were women around lunar cycles. And these were, lunar cycles were being appropriated for the most wonderful forms of solidarity in our earliest history where men and women as brothers and sisters always stuck by each other. Now this to me made complete sense. I mean, leaving aside the issue that I come out of trade unionism and brothers and sisters are the key term, the key ways you understand how you relate to your workmates, leaving that contemporary side aside, within the anthropology with matrilineal clans, it's all there in front of you about brothers and sisters in solidarity. And so if Chris Knight's model was correct, for which I thought there was good reasons to believe it was, and then when you shift back uh, to uh, all of this other stuff um, uh, about um, Hamlet's Mill and everything, I wanted much smaller scale amenable problems to deal with to try and show that astronomy is a key to prehistory and that actually this key, and we're still going through it in my view, but that's another story, as they say in Mexico. Um, but the, 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 the key thing is that all of history has been shaped by the collapse of that original solidarity 
and the way in which there's been a gradual, gradual removal of all power away from women and women and men as brothers and sisters. Uh, and that this is the basis of inequality. That was always my conviction. So I just narrowed it down to that series of issues to then try and use archaeoastronomy in particular as a way to test that theory. Uh, so I, I feel that I've, I have always made testable propositions, testable claims. Mm. And this is why I've so much enjoyed my time in SEAC, the Euro European Society of Astronomy and Culture, because they provided for me a wonderful test bed for the claims I was making, uh, because these are the people who know how to do archaeoastronomy. There we go. Someone say something. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, there are other very complicated questions. Um, somebody asking, is the red clay all around Silbury Hill or just in the southwest? Very good point. And that was the slide I didn't talk about. And the answer is no, it's not all around. And the bit is under Silbury Hill shouldn't be there. <laughs> it shouldn't be there at all because this red clay is the is the result of the dissolution of chalk as long as it had Triassic layers of rock above it, which was capping the chalk below it. So therefore all the red clay in the Avebury region, region is found at the tops of the surrounding chalk hills. It's not found in the valleys at the bottom of the chalk hills. So the answer is no, it's not everywhere. It's in this one particular place. There's another place about uh, five miles down the road uh, called Marden. There's another bit of chalk that is also slipped down from the upper chalk. So it's a very unusual place, carefully chosen. I'm asking because, um, sorry not to be writing in the chat, I just thought it'd be quicker because I'm rubbish at typing. At Clavercairns, they've got the red sandstone just in the west, southwest of each of the cairns. Yes. And so I just wondered if it was on that particular one, uh, no. no. Uh, that, sorry, sorry, what did you say, the Clavercairns, did you say? Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah no, I agree. I've, I've always argued that those bits there, that was the, sig the blood su signifier, within the Clava Cairns. Completely right, I agree. Thank you. And Fabio, do you want to say something? Do you want to, who are you, who are you yeah, I can. I, um, I, I was just asking whether, Lionel, whether you considered the possibility that the different layers of Silvery Hill are a reversal of the stratigraphy of the ground at the site, because you've got the clay, then the turf, then the chalk, which they've kind of reversed, and that would fit with the whole reversal syntax and or the interpretation of the entire complex as being the underworld and therefore the reverse of the stratigraphy. Thank you, Fabio. Exactly so. Exactly so. Um, and it's all there staring us in the face about these reversals of uh, uh, turf and soil from clay reversed with turf uh, and soil with chalk. It's all staring us in the face right there. In my view, it's an open book. It's an open book. And what you've just said, exactly right. Yeah. Can I, can I just say something, um, which is, uh, um, when, when you see the, um, the top of Silbury Hill, um, as you're crossing the river at that point five of yours, the, um, as, as you're crossing the, 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 the Winterbourne and you just see right below the horizon, this, this, this set moon. I mean, to me, that is just such a utterly compelling uh, image. Um, but you haven't said anything about the fact that you'd need some fire to illuminate it if it's in the dark. Do you want to say a bit more about the evidence for that? Because you, you, that, 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 that moon, if it is a moon, You'd, you'd, need to, you'd need a hell of a lot of light on it, wouldn't you, to make it visible from such a distance? Uh, maybe. I'm not sure about that, but it's a good question. Uh, and I would say we've not got much evidence for fires being lit around Silbury Hill or on its upper terrace. Um, there's not much evidence for it there. So 
again, it would be interesting to try and simulate uh, what light reflection properties were on that top terrace at uh, uh, early in the evening or very early in the morning. Um, because remember, when you're when you're looking, where was it when crossing the River Winterbourne? Mm. Uh, that was then. Uh, where, that was um, that was on the far eastern horizon. So, uh, Chris, that would be extremely early in the morning, uh, depending uh, like four or five or six in the morning mm. before the sun has risen. But you would have a glimmer of sunlight uh, on the Silbury Hill at that at that time. So it may well be that you don't need a fire up there very early in the morning. You've just got twilight mm. and the twilight will do the trick. So yeah. I, I, I don't feel I don't feel worried about that observation. I, I think it's it's just that think, you used to you used to we, we used to speculate. You used to speculate that perhaps they did light fires, and I was wondering if there was any. Yeah, I, I, can, I, see, I can see. I can imagine now. Of course, uh, you, you, your eyes would have been well used to the dark by that stage, and you'd see this yeah. ghostly, evidently white. Yeah, you know, which which would be obviously very ghostly and sort of dull. But then, of course, you'd expect that in the underworld. Yeah, but, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So I think it will work. Yeah. I've, I've noticed Camilla's just asked about. Were the neophytes nose bleeding or genitally cut? Uh, good, good question. Uh, <laughs> and I've got pictures of phalluses from Avery with incisions made on the glands of the phalluses. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, if, so I could just uh, wow get out my. <laughs> get, out, get out my scanner put it, in, put it in one of my articles and leave it to the archaeologists to stare at but tell us what you mean <laughs> tell us what you mean further, further to that is, is the analogy with New Guinea big men or with um, African pastoralist age sets um, yeah. Yeah. it's yeah. kind of with like cattle or pigs or yeah. Because we both. seem to have a bit of a mix here. We've got both. In fact, in the West Canet enclosures, there are two enclosures, enclosure one and two. In enclosure one, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pigs. In enclosure two, cattle, but mm -hmm. only, only bulls. In uh -huh. enclosure two. <laughs> I mean, as you look and drill it down into more and more details, Yeah. Each time you keep going, oh, I never expected that. <laughs> Yet another confirmation of a syntax that's working just brilliantly. So, again, wow. I, I, you know, I don't want to be, uh, you know, too triumphalist, of course, but I'm trying to limit to stuff that will be more and more amenable. But no, there is there are cut phalluses in chalk in the archaeology at Avebury, and there are bulls being uh, slaughtered uh, in one enclosure uh, and uh, okay. pigs being slaughtered in the other enclosure. Yeah, the and then the parallels... Side, Pardon me? Pigs with the left-hand side not thrown away. Yeah, exactly. Presumably therefore, or something. Yeah, therefore pigs are female. Yeah. Um, and therefore, and, and that this overlaps again with Greek myths, of course, with Persephone. Uh, because yeah. the, the moment before she's dragged down into the underworld, uh, the pigs are taken down before her mm -hmm. to join with her into the underworld. Yeah. Mm. So I'm afraid, folks, it all works very well. <laughs> <laughs> Couple more questions. Um, uh, Stacey and Carlos? Uh, a lake, a river, a lake bed of the underworld, allowing blood to flow between the world and the underworld. What's that? That's it. Stacey's got it. It's yeah. Stacey and Carlos. They're always right. right. And uh, that, 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 that this is an underworld lake traveling from the base of Silbury Hill and going into the West Kennet Palisades. Mm. Exactly so. The, 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 those neophytes walking down West Kennet Avenue coming from the Avery Circle and then walking upstream into the River Kennet 
they would have imagined themselves flowing through a river of blood, yeah. joining the blood, uh, as Chris would have put it, because, of course, behind all of this talk, there is another talk, which is the symbolism of dragons. And they would have considered themselves unified by the blood coming to be initiated, going into enclosure one and enclosure two of the West Kennet Palisades. And they would have felt themselves, because they're in enclosure one, which is, of course, the underworld, that they were in the underworld of blood. So Stacy, is it Stacy or is it Leticia? It's Stacy. Stacy, yeah, it's quite it was right. Actually, Stacey. Carlos. It was actually uh, Carlos. I Carlos. can't take credit for it. Good do, old Carlos. Do you, think Silbury Hill, like, do you think Silbury Hill might be a tapping stone to control the power within the hens that they made? Say that again. Do you think that the actual part of part of the hills function? could be as like a capping stone to control the power of the reverse, the underworld riverbed or lake bed or... Do you think that maybe it's just, like you said, to, they've made a hens round it to could put, keep the power. Do you think that might be part of like a massive way to cap it off so that it's only maybe it's, you can use it when you do or to, to try and contain it somehow? Great. Very good, yes. But of course, they also had to build, build the hill that high to be able to make it simulate the phases of the moon. So there was a double function. Once they built the hill that big, they could also use that capping function as, an, as another justification for doing it like that. Ian's got your, his hand up. Ian, go ahead. Yeah, just, just asking for a clarification, really, on the role of the, the retted we, uh, reeds. Yeah. Are the, do we know, uh, like... Uh, were they were they placed on the red clay and 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 would they in in rotting would they have an effect on color and so on? I mean, I've got this image of of like water in 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 winter passing through the substrate of the hill, the base of the hill, and 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 being red symbolically at least. But like, w w would the reeds have played any role in the rotting of the r reeds in relation? Was it in relation to the red clay? Very good question. Very good observation. The answer is I don't know. Um, the reeds, I think, almost certainly were flax. And flax is, of course, a... What's, what's it called? Um, it, it regulates the menstrual cycle, <laughs> flax. Um, so that, that was the only observation I've yet made. But, the, but what would happen with the... Um, the colour of the reeds before it was being squeezed by thousands of tonnes of chalk, I don't know. And again, that would be another interesting test of all of this and a de an elaborated detail, which I'm sure would generate some interesting insight, but what I don't know. And, and just as a supplementary to that, I mean, the, old, the sort of the thing about clay and chalk is that one retains water and, 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 and the other one, the, the, the water passes through. So in a sense, you've got a, an alternation of dry and wet within the hill. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to make a note of that, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Does anyone here know anything much about um, the um, Mayan and, um, and Aztec and, and, and uh, you know, sort of maybe parallel, you know, mounted to the sun and the moon? Because, of course, you yeah. know, that, that yeah. They, they found that the area around the pyramids would have flooded. They would have allowed water through so that the pyramids would have looked like they were, you know, sort of floating. And so perhaps... Mm. Um, that was a, a similar thing here, visual, I mean. I, I, I'm wondering if the, if the water would have run through the reed layer and picked up any of the ochre, turning the water a different color as well. Is this Leticia speaking? Yes. Uh, hello, Leticia. I'm sorry, I didn't understand you at first. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know. Could be. It would work for me if it did. Yeah. Don't know. Hmm. Interesting. 
questions. Yogi has a question. Um, if the happenings inside the mound should not have gone out to the world, wouldn't the ditch be inside the banks? <laughs> Hello, Yorg. <laughs> Lovely to yeah. see you. Thank you for coming. Um, well, um, I was wondering about this, and then uh, the ditch that encircled the ditch number one that encircled the centre was then replicated by at least four other ditches as the mound was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the last ditch was the one outside, which we can see. You can see. Okay. See. So, okay. Uh, so, um, so, um, something's going wrong where I can't speak properly. Can you hear me clear? Yep. Yeah. Can hear. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure how to answer it, you So, um, I just think uh, the ditch and the bank together, like at Stonehenge, we have the ditch outside and the bank inside, um, whereas at Avebury, we've always had the uh, the bank outside and the ditch inside. But here at Silbury Hill, as you say, we have the bank inside and the ditch outside. Um, so, I don't know, we just accept it. And that's the way it works to keep the inside separate from the outside. Okay. <laughs> Um, Ed is asking if there's any red earth at Stonehenge. Yes, there is. Who asked that? S sorry, who Ed asked that question? Hurst. Ed. Ed Hurst. Ed, yes, there is. Hmm. You have to hunt Another for election. it, Ed. You have to hunt for it. <laughs> Any more? Um, Where is that anyway? Where is he? Um, so what else have we got? Um, Letitia asking about the reeds. Um, that the river Cunnet is evidently the river Cunt. I think we'll yep. let that go. Yeah. Um, uh, if the reeds not flax, if reeds not flax, they grow above and below water in and out of the underworld. That's Felix. Yeah. Um, suggesting that. Um, yep. Oh, somebody's contesting the cunt um, uh, etymology. Um, it could be bright hound, kuna, instead of cunt. Hmm. Okay. I think it's probably a bit of ambiguity there. Um, what else? Somebody saying, David Fisher, thanks for occasionally using the terms limit and extreme instead of lunar standstill. Is that an argument? Uh, yeah, David. Hello, David. Um, yeah, this is quite right. <clears throat> we're, we're all held back by the context in which we work. And lunar standstill has now become, you know, like a standard term used. And I'm one of them continuing to use it. And David is quite right to point out to me that technically it's not correct. There is no such thing as a lunar standstill. And I, I get round it by saying, within a small area on the horizon, the moon <coughs> concentrates. And that small area is plus or minus 1.5 degrees. And that this movement within this small area of about three degrees is, is pretty much random. There is no single obvious extreme position for the moon where its horizon position is stable. David's quite right. And David led on that paper that we jointly did where we pointed this out. Thanks, David. And it was great. Oh, I appreciate that you it. 
yeah, it's thanks that you collaborated. That was a big help to me, collaborating with you on that paper. Tam's got his hand up, Camilla. Yeah. Tam? Hi, Lionel. Thanks so much. That was You're amazing. Welcome, Tam. Yeah. Um, I, my ears pricked up about, about the Druids angle um, get brought up because it was in relation to William Blake. And in the past, they saw that he had... He had split from the Druids because of their sacrificial rites that they were kind of. But what I just found, I just had a little look. It says that in Jerusalem, this is the Tate Gallery saying, Albion is infected with a soul disease and her mountains run with blood. Yeah. And I thought, wow, <laughs> yeah. that does seem to tie in. Um, yeah. I don't know if anybody, if you know, anybody's looked at William Blake from these sorts of angles. <laughs> and that's that's fantastic. And of course, artists get things. They, they, they perhaps don't quite know why they get things, but they get it. Uh, and you can see great truths hidden in much art that mm. us scientists <laughs> take centuries to try and decode. <laughs> Whereas an artist gets it in one go, quick. So that's where where in did you say in Blake or Byron? It's in, yeah, it's in in Jerusalem in his uh, last big illuminated book. Uh, yeah, that uh, it says this is from the uh, just the Tate Gallery. Tate's uh, they they say that they quote Blake saying uh, Albion, England is infected with a soul disease and her, quote, mountains run with blood. Yeah, They fantastic. say it's as a consequence of the Napoleonic Wars, but yeah. maybe it's more to do with, uh, yeah. Yeah. with this. Yeah, well, yeah. Napoleonic Wars, Wars weren't during Albion, but yeah. Yeah. Tam, thank you. Very good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lionel. Amazing. You're welcome, mate. You're welcome. Uh, So a couple more questions. I think we've got to wind up. Um, Sam is asking about the components of the hills are representing a creation myth, such as in Bruce Lincoln's book, separate pieces of a body remade cosmologically and the reeds representing something like skin. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I was thinking through my research that I was never going to find anything like this uh, in the Avery or Stonehenge monuments. I never, I never anticipated uh, that we would get direct references to 29.5 day cycles of blood rituals. I never thought it would have been preserved that long into the Neolithic. And I thought I was going to have to start with Brian Lincoln in particular, in particular, with all of his stuff in Great. death, war, and sacrifice. And I thought that was going to be as far as we could get to embodied blood rituals, just ghastly stories about men chopping each other's heads off. Um, and instead, we've got this ref reference in Silbury Hill towards, um, towards the 29.5 day, day lunar blood cycle. So when I found it there, I, I was just astonished. Uh, but nevertheless, you're quite right, Sam. Um, Brian Lincoln, um, his work on the Indo-European mythology, very good, very powerful, a step further down the road of history than the one I think I'm finding at Avebury and Stonehenge. The step on, the one step further on, is the work that everything you find in Lincoln, uh, a man of great scholarship, and lots of lots of details there, which are very, very important. So thank you for, the, for put, drawing in Lincoln into all of this. Um, two last points about Thomas the Rhymer, Scottish ballad for a male initiation of seven year intervals, where he crosses a river of blood at a three way crossroad. And Jackie's <laughs> telling us that the hill which is Tom Nohrick Hill in Inverness, associated, has is a flat-topped mound. Fantastic. 
Who is this person? Who is this? <laughs> um, this is Ed Hurst and comment by Jackie. Well, they're fantastic. I want them. <laughs> I want these references. This is fantastic. Uh, the um, reference to um, a crossroad of three roads, that comes straight out of Hecat in the Greek myths. You know, the, the dark moon goddess, Hecat. Um, so fantastic blood, seven year rituals. Yes, seven years is good enough for me. It's getting close to nine. <laughs> <laughs> it's also, Tom Nahuri Hill is also associated with being hollow and kings sleeping underneath it. Ah. Time travel, you can see it's amazing views. It's an esker, but yeah. it looks like a huge, and it's bang on north facing. Wow. North facing, and you can see right out to Fort Rose and across out the Firth or yeah. down um, the Loch Ness Valley as well, and three roads meet around it and the River Ness. Look, there's, there's a PhD here for someone. <laughs> Don't let this go to waste. You're at the RAG evening yeah. class. This is a gold mine, this stuff that you're now hearing. North <laughs> facing, north facing, perfect view of the Draco constellation. Perfect yeah. view. <laughs> There's a PhD just in those three sentences you've come up with. Archaeologists up here are absolutely so, so gutted because they turned it into a cemetery about 150 years ago, and there's so much evidence there of oh, it being down uh, Green Hill or uh, even yeah. Tom Hurish. Uh, people think it might be the place of the yew trees. Yeah. But, um, it also um, coincides with the Gaelic of Uarish and Uar and to do with time as well so those sort of root words are the seasons in fact so it's really I'm, really interesting i'm working on it <laughs> lovely well done from what you've just said alone rescue archaeology and rescue anthropology will bring all of this stuff to life yet again it's fantastic stuff amazing thank you all this is such a good group i love <laughs> <laughs> there is a monster there's a monster loch ness yeah yeah am i right yeah absolutely of course there is. Mm. Which St. Columba is meant to have driven out as well. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Have we run out of questions just about, or is there any more? I think we've just about run out of questions. Anybody else? I had one. I just sent it, but I don't oh, know if it go. got through. Yeah. Well, you sent it. Is it York? Yes. I mean, my guess is oh, then all the yeah. different stages of Silbury Hill, I think they will have it, a functionality in itself. They would have, they, I mean, once they completed one mound with one set of banks and ditches or not, it would probably have functioned as well. And then they built on, on top of it. So it would be a progress. I don't think they had in mind the final stage. I mean, they had it probably as well, but all the stages in between would have made sense in themselves as well. But what they are, obviously, I would have no idea. Yep, but that's the point, Jörg. You'll have to say what they are before you can say they didn't have an idea about the final form. Because I've just found lots of evidence to show that in its final form, it makes complete sense, not just to... Uh, the material inside, but also according towards two lunar cycles that can be explained, but only when Silbury Hill is in its final 37 meter high form. So in anticipation of this sort of challenge, I calculated the statistical probability of its final form being an accident. And I calculate that 14,312 alternative positions could be, you could see all of these views, but I've explained just one out of 14,312 that exactly fits my theory. So you've got to come up with 13,311 other bits of evidence to explain to me why I'm wrong and you're right, okay? I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying once they completed one thing, it would have been fine. And from there on, they could then have... Been, I mean, 
I find it difficult to imagine that because bearing in mind how long it took from the start to the big, to the finish of it, that would span generations. Well, uh, hundred years, hundred years. Yeah, and that's at that time three generations roughly, or whatever. Sure, sure. So that to actually kind of get this message across and that people actually can follow this is okay. is quite difficult because I can only assume everything from my lifespan and. It's just yeah. hard to imagine how two generations later are going to continue this big project. That's exactly how pastoral cultures work, in which you venerate the ancestors. Hunter-gatherers aren't interested in the ancestors. Pastoralists are, because you have to accumulate wealth to be able to reproduce the patrilineal clans. And therefore, they're very long viewing. They exact, that's exactly what pastoralists are all about. So I think you've got it the wrong way around here. The thing is the final form is what they were going for. I quite agree there could have been intermediate functions as well. I quite agree what they are, I haven't got a clue because as uh, Fabio pointed out earlier, the way in which the syntax of the materials is organized is in very close interconnection through opposition between white and red. And that, that therefore needs the white bit on top to explain the contradiction with the red thing at the bottom. So I think there's a coherent argument for its large fi final form. And I don't think there's a coherent argument for its intermediate forms. But that's a good, it's a good challenge and it would be a good debate. My, my thing is, why would there be turf in between in the beginning? There, there was one stage, there was turf over it. So I would think that turf kind of that must have been at least one or two years to grow and, and, and might have been used. They, they didn't continuously build it. So they no, had no. some gap in between, maybe. You're, you're, no, you've, you've got it wrong. Please read the book. The turfs, okay. the turfs weren't there because they left it alone for 20 or 30 years. The turfs were immediately covered and fresh. Okay. okay? okay. So okay. You, you need to know the details, otherwise you'll get yourself in a problem there. Be well, yeah, I, I don't know the details. <laughs> okay, well, exactly. But just when I think turf and how long it takes, that's my no. assumption. That there was some gap in between, but no, but yeah, no gap, no gaps. Okay. Continuous building. Uh, my wife has just hit me over the head and told me I've got to shut up because I'm wearing myself <laughs> out, and my wife has got much more sense than I. So everyone, <laughs> thank you ever so much. I've enjoyed it tonight. Fabio, thank you for the comments you made. Thank you. Thank you, Lionel. That was absolutely marvellous. Absolutely Load away. Amazing. It's, it's just, you're about to take off over the next 10, 20 years. You're just, you're just, you're just at the start of your career, uh, Lionel. So well done. Brilliant. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Cheers, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you, Lionel. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.